Well, today it's my privilege to introduce my pastor, Dr. Chuck Swindoll, or simply Chuck. His is a familiar name to many Christians around the world. In fact, I'd be willing to bet, uh, prophesy, uh, that uh, many of you are here because of him and his ministry. He served Dallas Seminary well as the fourth president and is known by millions around the world for his practical application of the Bible to everyday living. He now serves Dallas Seminary as Chancellor Emeritus. He is also the senior pastor teacher of Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco, Texas. He and his wife, Cynthia, reside here in the Metroplex, and they love to spend much of their time with their four grown children and 10 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. So join with me in welcoming Chuck to our pulpit today in chapel. Good morning. It's always such a pleasure to be with you today, uh, today especially, and I thank you for your presence. I know that the Omicron is sweeping across our area. It's a bit of a risk to come into a group like this, so thank you for risking and for coming together. Uh, I. I, I want to begin by asking you a question. Everything I have to say today will, will relate to the answer to this question. But first, think about it, will you? What are you leaving for the next generation? What will you pass on to those who will outlive you? The questions may seem a little irrelevant because you're young, you who are students, and you have most of your life spread out before you, and probably among the last things you think about would be those who will outlive you, but there will be many and as you minister in the years to come, you will meet them, you'll serve them, and you'll leave them with the lasting impressions that even your death will not erase. I want to talk about those impressions. Stephen King is a horror novel writer, as all of you know. He's rich, he's famous, and he's also very human. Neither his notoriety nor his wealth could protect him from a very serious car accident that happened a number of years ago. It was a hit and run. The other car fled. I don't recall if his car was totaled or almost, but he wound up thrown from the vehicle in a ditch, bleeding. He was in a remote area in the countryside. He was seriously injured. Had he not been found and airlifted to a local hospital, he could easily have died. And that traumatic event left him differently than he was before it happened. It was his wake-up call, as he put it. And at this time, it wasn't some horrifying story that he created in his mind, it was an actual event that for all he knew would cripple him for the rest of his days. He wrote about it and uh, I have come across the piece that he wrote and I, I want to read it to you. These are Stephen King's words 
after he had recovered in the hospital and was able to go home, he wrote this. A couple of years ago, I, I found myself, I've, I've, I really found out what it meant that you can't take it with you. Uh, I found out while I was lying in a ditch at the side of the country road, covered with mud and blood, and with the tibia of my right leg poking out of the side of my jeans like the branch of a tree taken down in a thunderstorm. I had a MasterCard uh, in my wallet, but when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair and blood all over you, no one accepts MasterCard. We all know that life is ephemeral, but on this particular day and in the months that, that followed, I got a painful but extremely valuable look at life's simple backstage truths. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed when we go out, but we're just as broke. Warren Buffett going out broke. Bill Gates going out broke. Tom Hanks going out broke. Steve King broke, not a crying dime at his death. All the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, all the mutual funds you trade, all of that is mostly smoke and mirrors. It's still going to be a quarter past getting late whether you tell time on a Timex or a Rolex. No matter how large your bank account, no matter how many credit cards you have, sooner or later, things will begin to go wrong with the only three things you have that you can really call your own, your body, your spirit, and your mind. So I want you to consider making your life one long gift to others. And why not? All you have is on loan anyway. All that lasts is what you pass on. Everything I have to say has to do with those last eight words of Stephen King. All you have is what you pass on. And I realize it's easy to forget that when you're involved in your studies in ministry, preparing for a lifetime of reaching, touching, serving the lives of others. It's easy while here to be focused only on what you're getting. And that makes sense. You've come for an education. You seek to learn things you've not known before so that you might use them in a career that stretches out before you. But I want you to remember today that all that lasts is what you pass on. It will not be your financial portfolio. It will not be your possessions. It will not even be those precious family photos. What you will pass on, most importantly, will be a life well-lived. 
ideally lived for others. The legacy of a series of life-changing relationships that you cultivate in the years ahead, I would even add in the years you were at this school. In case you wonder what that might look like, you need not wonder any longer. Thanks to the Apostle Paul's careful work in Romans, we find a veritable checklist of the qualities that are worth passing on from one life to another. In the latter half of Romans chapter 12, all the attention that we give to Romans usually falls on the first part of the chapter. I'd like to emphasize the latter part. We haven't the time to cover all the verses that follow verse 8. We usually give attention to verses 1 to 8. I'm looking at 9 through 16, actually, and I want to read the verses for you carefully and slowly. I want you to listen for characteristics in a life worth living. Paul writes in verse 9 from the New Living Translation, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. He goes on. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Literally, the Greek says, with a zealous spirit. I love that. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help. Always be eager to practice hospitality. The list just goes on and on, doesn't it? Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Candidly, uh, I don't know of a better list to shape one's life with than that list. Uh, I once preached on that section. I called it Christianity 101. It's the living out of the life of Christ, emphasizing these various character traits that are worth passing on and yet are so easily forgotten in the midst of our busy, preoccupied world. Not surprisingly, love takes center stage right away, as it should, for it is the pervasive trait that colors all others. So Paul though he doesn't go into such detail as in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul highlights love and not only lands there, but stays there for a little longer than with any of the other characteristics. Let me say a couple of things about love. The best definition I've come across is that love is seeking the highest good of the other person. It's not making the other person comfortable. It's not telling him or her what he or she wants to hear. It isn't treating another like he or she treated you. 
It isn't looking the other way when another does wrong. Love sometimes must be tough, even stern and, and always relentless. Other times, admittedly, it is soft and it is affirming, reassuring, and, and full of forgiveness and compassion. Why is it so important? As I said earlier, it colors all of these other traits. John Stott puts it this way. Each staccato imperative adds a fresh ingredient to the apostle's recipe for love here in Romans 12. When it is lived out, it wears these various garments. The first is, as you will see in this passage, it is unhypocritical. Literally, the verse reads, agape anhypocritas, love unhypocritical. So the first side of the coin is sincerity, a love that's sincere. Uh, it isn't play acting. It, it isn't phony baloney. It isn't act one way and think another. It isn't something with hidden motives as we act out. Love is not theater. John Murray writes, if love is the sum of virtues and the hypocrisy, the epitome of vice, what a contradiction to bring these two together. Let's face it, our culture is, is uh, saturated uh, with hypocrisy. It goes all the way to the state, to the nation's capital. We see it on display on our televisions at night. Polish the, in, the image while hiding the reality. We use words that impress, but the fact is, we do not often mean them. So love is to be sincere. Second, it is to be discerning. That's the other side of the same coin of love. Love is not blind sentiment. It has backbone. It doesn't check its brains at the door when it walks into the room of good and evil. Love clings to truth. It bonds like glue. Remember, it's what you pass on that will last. Make sure that it includes a life of love. People who most impacted my life while in the most impressive years of my earlier days were those who truly loved me. They loved me enough to tell me the truth. They loved me enough to look past those things that should not have been. They loved me in, often in spite of myself. There are several other components and they're all set forth in this passage. He moves quickly to devoted affection. You'll see that here in verses nine through 16. Verse 10 refers to devoted affection. Paul draws upon terms that are usually refer, reserved for the family. Familial affection. Philadelphia, the same kind of devotion that you find when family members are in harmony with one another. 
Let that be true in the family of God, he's saying. Deep familial affection, warmth and depth. And second, he mentions in verse 10, to honor one another. One of my favorite concepts. It works its way out in listening when they speak. Caring about how they feel. Paying attention to their opinions. And showing gratitude for their lives, and saying so. So important that we be demonstrative in these qualities. Third is one of my favorites, enthusiasm, passion. This is not a shallow, superficial excitement like you'd see at a ball game. This is long-lasting optimism. True zeal about the work of the ministry. I urge you in that. I have a friend who said he learned at the school he attended that he did his best preaching when he preached on tiptoe. You live your life on tiptoe when you live it with zeal and enthusiasm. Some time ago, I came across a, a work titled The Art of Possibility by Benjamin Zander. Benjamin Zander at that time was the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic, also a teacher, a professor at the New England Conservatory of Music. He wrote this in a part of his book. Listen to what he says about enthusiasm. I love this example. I had listened to one of uh, my students who was a pianist. I watched her perform a Bach suite in D minor. And uh, I realized that uh, the student was able to play the piece and could handle it theoretically. I also saw a young pianist playing Chopin's Prelude in my master's class, and although we had worked right up to the edge of realizing the overarching concept of the piece, his performance uh, remained, well, earthbound, shall we say. He understood it intellectually. He, he could have explained it to someone theoretically, but uh, he was unable to convey the emotional energy that, that the true language of the music held within it. And so, as I noticed it, I saw that his, his body was firmly centered in the upright position on this piano stool. And uh, so I blurted out, can you imagine in the middle of this man's piece, the trouble is you are a two-buttock player, I yelled in the class. I encouraged him to allow his whole body to flow sideways from one cheek to the other on the bench, and he would catch the wave of the music, and, and, and it would, the shape of his own body would convey the enthusiasm of the music. Several in the audience gasped when I made my comment, but later they felt the emotional dart hit home as a new distinction was born. The one buttock player, he made the mention. He said, we had in the class that day, the CEO of a company uh, from Ohio who was there with us, and he wrote me later and said, I was so moved by what you said, I went home and I formed my whole company around the idea of a one but a company, which is a whole new concept. I'm suggesting a one but a ministry that you might think about. You've got to be careful who you suggest that to, however. 
he goes on to talk about a cellist. He said, I, 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 I met Jacqueline Dupre in the 1950s when I was 20, and she was only 15. Get this. She was uh, just a schoolgirl who blossomed into the, the, the greatest cellist of her generation. What enthusiasm! Her uh, performance of the two cellos uh, by Schubert uh, as she played a duet with another uh, stayed with me for the rest of my life. Uh, when she was just six years old, the story goes, someone saw her running down the corridor with her little cello held above her head. The uh, custodian uh, looked at her and thought he saw a face of relief as she was grinning from ear to ear. And so he referred to that saying, how wonderful it must have been when you played. She said, no, I haven't played yet, but I look forward to, I'm just about to play my, my piece. There was an excitement before she even went in to play her piece. Uh, I, I would love to light a fire of excitement under many a young preacher I've uh, endured while listening to as they go along with their very accurate uh, exposition of a passage but lacking in enthusiasm. Don't leave that out. Don't forget that. Uh, it, it's amazing what happens in the pulpit and how it affects the pew. Uh, Howie Hendricks used to say, a mist in the pulpit puts a fog in the pew. Uh, a sleepy preacher puts people out right away. And therefore, I urge you to think seriously about a life of passion. When you share that, literally, people do not forget. Then he mentions patience and uh, the importance of enduring hard times and being steadfast in prayer, something that is so easily, easily forgotten in our lives. Came across an interesting story regarding prayer. A group of young college students went to hear Charles Haddon Spurgeon preach. They had never been to the tabernacle in London, and therefore they had never seen him in person. They were waiting out in the cold while the doors were still locked, waiting for them to open. While they were there, an older gentleman walked up and asked uh, if, if, if they would like to come and see the heating plant of the church. They thought, well, they weren't interested too much in the heating plant, but it might be a place to get warm. And they didn't want to offend the old man, so they said, sure. So they walked behind him as they went down a stairway and came to a door that he opened slowly and they looked inside, and there were 700 people on their knees. And he whispered, here is the heating plant of the church. And they realized that above them was a sanctuary that would soon be filled with God's blessing. But the heating plant was down below. When it was all over, the older gentleman introduced himself to them. It was Spurgeon himself who wanted them to know the value of prayer as it relates to the ministry of the word. And I would emphasize the same to all of you. If you have a body of people who hold you up in prayer, you're a rich individual. Billy Graham used to talk about the one who would get the greater reward himself or the, the lady who prayed for him throughout his ministry back home, and he was quick to say the greater reward will go to her. Encourage great commitment to prayer in your ministry. It will outlive you and it will not be forgotten by others. Fifth, he mentions generosity in verse 13. We tend immediately to think of being generous with money, but there are other kinds of generosity. Generosity of our time, 
generosity of interest and attention. When you talk to others, be sure you look at them rather than around them. Generosity of encouragement. These are all what we call random acts of kindness that mean so much to others. And then he mentions hospitality. You know what the, the uh, Greek term for hospitality mean? It really is? It, it really comes from the words love of strangers. Reaching out to those you've not known before. Make a habit of that in your life and in your ministry. It's, it, we're not simply to be hospitable. This word here is pursue hospitality. Take time for those whom you've not known before and reach out to them. And then, of course, would be empathy. That would be both sympathy for those who are sad and the ability to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're better at the former than we are at the latter. When we see someone broken in grief, our hearts quickly are moved over that. But when another is promoted, how rarely we rejoice over their promotion. How good it is that you cultivate the habit of writing a note of congratulations to those who've achieved something of a particular benefit or celebrative note in their life that's so valuable that you rejoice with those who rejoice. There's an old Swedish proverb that used to hang in a little frame in our kitchen at home that my mother would often read. Shared sorrow is a double, shared joy is a double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. The blessing in it is in the sharing of it. As a minister of the gospel, be one who shares in this, in the lives of others. As they rejoice, rejoice with them. As they grieve, take time to grieve with them. How valuable that is in ministry. It's all back to love, isn't it? Love sings when those around us are singing. Love mourns when those around us are weeping. Love laughs when those around us are cheery and filled with joy. Love stays awake when those around us cannot sleep. All of this sets the stage for the seventh and final expression of true love that's worth passing on. This is one of the fairest flowers that ever grew, humility. He mentions it in verse 16. He speaks here against our being snobbish, proud of our status, proud of our training, of our degrees, of our birth, of our giftedness proud of our accomplishments. The remedy is, is to remember how everything got started in your life. Remember where you were when you just began life. Years ago, my daughter and I we're traveling from Southern California, younger daughter and I. We were going to Houston, and uh, it was a long trip. We loved it being together. We had stopped in a place uh, for the for the night uh, when we got nearer Houston, and uh, she was looking at the map. That's where we would be traveling tomorrow as we got to Houston, and she said, "Oh, Daddy," she said, "Look here." Uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to be on a road that's not that far from El Campo, which is the great white way of my birth. And, uh, of course, you've never heard of it. And 
most people on the planet have never heard of it, but she had heard me talk about the little town of El Campo where I was born. She said, I'd love to go there. And I said, sure, we'd, we'd pull off and take that side road and visit there. I'd, I'd not been there since forever. So we drove in the town and a little nostalgic seeing some of the sights as you go through when you go to the place where you were born and spent your earliest years. She said, do you know the, the house? I've heard you talk about it where, where, where you were born. My dad used to say that all three of the kids were, were uh, birthed in the same bed where they were conceived. My mother never liked it that he told that to everybody he met, <laughs> but uh, he was proud of it. She said, you, can you think we can find that place? I said, well, it's a little garage apartment. Maybe we can find granddaddy's place, and then I'll take a right and another right, and I think that'll be. So I did that, and there it was. <laughs> Tiny. In fact, it's leaning a little bit toward the north <laughs> as a result of the, the uh, ocean breeze or the, or the bay breeze that blows across El Campo not far from Palacios. And she said, turn the, turn the motor off, turn the engine off. So I did. And we just sat and looked at it. She put her hand over on mine. I'll never forget this. And she said, gosh, Daddy. Like, is that it? <laughs> I go, yeah, isn't that impressive? This, look at that. Then all of a sudden, she began to cry. She said, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I think it's great, she said, that I can see where it all got started. I remembered a statement one of the prophets made, that we should remember the hole from which we were dug. I sat in the car and I looked at this little place. I remember we had a cow out back. My mom and dad took turns milking it. So we would have food and a little four room garage apartment, older brother, older sister and I, all born. And for the first few years of our lives, reared there. Who would ever know? Who would ever care? It was good for me to see it and to put myself back in that place and remember. I suggest you do that sometime in your own life. Clarence Thomas did that. I remember reading his memoirs Several years ago, you remember Clarence Thomas, Justice on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. He tells the whole story in his book, My Grandfather's Son, which he became because his grandfather raised him. I want you to hear his roots. I'm descended from the West African slaves who lived on the barrier islands in Georgia. My people were called Geechees. Mother was born out of wedlock. Her mother died in childbirth. And she saw little of her father who was a slave as she was just a child. I was delivered by Lula Kemp, my midwife, who came from the nearby community of Sandfly. He, by the way, was born in Pinpoint. He says in the book, neither is on the map, it's too small. 
pinpoint and send fly. Our lives were a daily struggle for the barest of essentials, food, clothing, and shelter. The place in which I was born was a shanty. Kerosene lamps lit the house. Water came from a nearby faucet that stuck out of the ground, and we carried it through the woods in old lard buckets. They were small enough for us to to uh, fill up and tote home where we poured the contents into the wash tub or uh, larger kitchen buckets out of which we, we drank with a dipper. In the winter time, we plugged up the cracks and the holes and the walls with old newspapers. That was the late 1940s in Pinpoint, Georgia. Fast forward to the fall of 1991. Following his being sworn in, he writes, I walked into the awe-inspiring great hall of the court and through the imposing doorway, glancing at the huge brass doors. We then walked slowly down the gleaming white marble steps, lit by the brightness of a beautiful sunny morning. I thought back to another sunny day when my brother and I had walked for miles through the woods to a house where we would live with our grandparents. All of our belongings were stuffed into a pair of grocery bags. Every time I look at the, the nine justices, I always spot Justice Thomas and remember the hole from which he was dug. No wonder he still has a heart for the ordinary person. Never lose that heart, men and women. I don't care what title you're given. I don't care what degrees you earn. I don't care what amount of money you may make. Your humility is worth passing on, and it starts with remembering how life began for you. Whether it's El Campo or Sandfly or Pinpoint or wherever. The man understands both extremes, doesn't he? What a list. Devoted affection, honor and respect, enthusiasm and passion, patience, generosity, empathy and sympathy, humility. Love. I think I'm probably looking into the faces of some whose love has been burned. I regret that for you because it probably has caused you to restrain yourself lest you be burned again. I want to caution you about that. People don't show love either because they're proud or because they're afraid of the risk. I hope as the minister of the gospel, 
you will leave both aside and let your love flow. Don't forget to write the words, I love you, to others outside your family. Use the pronoun. And when you're with them, don't be afraid to say it. Your love will last long after your face is forgotten. Your love will linger forever in another's life. But it's a risk. C.S. Lewis writes in Four Loves, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrong and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully all around with, with hobbies and, and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket of your selfishness. And in that casket, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. What are you passing on to others, those who will outlive you? Give it thought, because as Stephen King has written, all that lasts is what you pass on. All that lasts is what you pass on. I understand. I, I, I know your life is busy. I know there are deadlines. I know there are demands. I know there are exams. I understand. I, I, I know it like the back of my hand. But in all of your getting, all of your learning, pay attention to some qualities that will be seen in you over and above the sermons you preach, the counsel you give, the books you write. Give attention to these qualities. That's what they'll remember when you're gone. Bow with me, please. Thank you, Father, for this uh, brief journey through this splendid passage of Scripture. Thank you for leading Paul to write it and putting it in our language so we can grasp it. Thank you for the reminders today of the value of them. May we not soon forget them. May they be demonstrated first at home 
with those who know us best. At school, where we are in training with others, learning and growing together, and ultimately in places where we will minister in the years to come. These are our way of saying, just be glorified in us and through us, in our lives, be magnified. I pray in the name of our model, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Everyone said,